which was the set of all subsets of the integers from 1 to n, correct? So 2 to the n is the number of subsets of a set with n elements. And you can partition the set of subsets. How? According to what parameter, folks? According to what parameter? Say it loudly. Cardinality or size. So every subset of a set with n elements has to have either zero elements, or one element, or two elements, etc., etc., etc. So you can partition the set of all subsets of the integers from 1 to n by the quantum of cardinality they have. So this is equal to the summation i equals 0 to n. Um, so you could just say number of subsets with precisely i elements. Because every subset will have uh, you know, some number of elements between 0 and n. But one of the points of chapter 5 was that we know a formula for the number of subsets of an n element set which have i elements. And that is? So that was one identity that we got by partitioning a set of sets. And you do have to know this for the exam people. It'll be 20% of the exam. This is going to be a question where you're going to be partitioning a set of sets. And you just have to have an idea how to do it. I hope you've been thinking about it a lot. The next uh, set you partitioned a set of sets with was, oh, there was this one. Um, let's say uh, n plus 1 choose k plus 1. n plus 1 choose k plus 1. Well, what were you partitioning, folks? What were you partitioning? <coughs> Go ahead. The number of subsets which had the last element, the number of subsets, and that was one of the elements which it didn't have the last element. Wait, so he's referring to an identity you, where you partition a set of subsets depending upon whether or not the subsets contain or don't contain a given element, correct? Yeah. That gives you a different identity. Does somebody want to tell me what identity results? It's not this one, by the way. If n is a natural number, okay, and x and y are arbitrary integers, so these are arbitrary integers, 0, negative, positive, you don't care with x and y, but you want n, the modulus, to be a positive integer. Um, we, we write, well, this is the notation, x triple bar y mod n, and say x is congruent to y mod n. Say x is congruent to y. <coughs> if and only if, I'm going to give you two definitions which are equivalent. Um, I'll usually prove things using the first definition. But the second definition is sometimes handy in terms of thinking intuitively. So this is true if and only if one. What's the divisibility condition for congruence equivalence, folks? Does anybody know? That's right. If and only if x minus y is a multiple of n. That is to say, if and only if n evenly divides x minus y. And you know, that's the cleanest definition for proving things about, you know, modulus and modular <laughs> Another way of saying this is as follows, i.e., <coughs> or alternatively, both of these conditions mean the same thing. What's another way of saying that x is congruent to y mod n? Does anybody know the so-called alternative definition? You can write it uh, you can write in the form of uh, x is equal to kn plus, off, or plus y. Right, which means that x and y. Uh, it's basically the division algorithm. The division algorithm. The division algorithm gives you the. <coughs> the remainder. What about the remainder? It's between 0 and. n minus 1. And what about the remainder of x when 
divided by n. And what about the remainder of y when divided by n? Anybody? Why? They're the same. They leave the same remainder when you divide by n. If it only is x and y leave the same remainder when divided by m. So if it only is x and y leave the same remainder. All right, then we'll do some examples. So so how should one think of this? How should one think of congruence? Well. Let's stop and have an idea. The first way people go ahead. Uh, would you say that uh, 100 equal or 102 equals 12 plus? Because the remainder would divide 102 by 10 to 2. Yes. But also, you could, you can express 112 as 12 plus like 9 times 10. Right. So. so by your second definition, 102 and 12 both leave the same remainder divided by 10. 112 and. 102 and 12 are congruent mod 10. Okay. Yes, by both definitions, because math is consistent. I mean, it does require a proof, but yes, 102 and 12 are congruent mod 10. Because they both leave 2 as a remainder when divided. Or they're both going to be odd, or they're going to have opposite parity. So in other words, that's like saying, if they're both even, that means that they're congruent mod 2. If they're both odd, that means they're congruent mod 2, if you look at this definition. And if they're of opposite parity, that means that they're not congruent mod 2. So evenness and oddness is just a way to break the set of integers into two parts, correct? So think of mod n is simply a way to divide the integers into n parts in a natural way. And you see, when you start studying mathematics, you see that all of the little non-existence proofs you can get by using evenness and oddness somehow can be extended and made more powerful by invoking mod n and generalizing. So, and it just so happens that things work out nicely, like all the properties of even and odd. If you add two evens, you get an even. And if you add an odd and an even, you get... If you add two odds, you get... Even. So that kind of property about how you add even and odd things together, you know what you're going to get, that can be extended to modular arithmetic mod n. So without further ado, just note, <coughs> note that, uh, well, here's a claim. I, might, I may or may not prove it. Claim. Um, if n is an element of n, then the relation on Z, then the relation on Z, defined by, well, how should you relate a pair of integers? Well, defined by X, R, Y, if and only if, well, they leave the same remainder when divided by X, i.e., if and only if, x congruent to y mod n. Anyhow, that definition of a relation on z is an equivalence relation. Um, the book has a proof of this. I don't think I'm going to prove it. So let's stop in our brains and let's see if we can quickly prove as much as we want. For it to be an equivalence relation, you need to know what first. It's reflective. That means that x is related to x. Well, does that mean that you should always have x congruent to x mod n? Should it always be the case that x is congruent to x mod n? Why? Because n divides x minus x. Because n divides 0. Everything divides to zero. Make sense? <coughs> now, if x is related to y, that means n divides x minus y. So it fits your brain. You can read this in the book. If x is related to y, that means n divides x minus y. Is there any reason why n should divide y minus x? Negative x minus y. Oh, because it's negative of 
of x minus y. So if x minus y over n is an integer, then y minus x over n will also be an integer, namely the opposite. The transitive law is also relatively easy to verify. It just says that if n divides x minus y and n divides y minus z, here, why don't, why don't we just have you show example? Why don't you guys show, show x congruent to y mod n, comma, y congruent to z mod n. Why don't you assume that and show that that implies that x is congruent to z mod n. That's actually uh, the only substantial part of showing that congruence defines an equivalence relation on z.